So it's Friday, so it's time for poets. Some of us know that as push off early tomorrow's Saturday. But in this context, it's the perioperative enhancement team. Inspired by Dr. Sol Aronson and the team at Duke, a selection of clips to get us thinking about the next steps in providing world-class perioperative care. You'll find the full lectures in our back catalogue, or join us at the upcoming perioperative practicum for expert discussions, business case tips, and hands-on workshops. Go to www.ebpom.org and look for our international program of perioperative practicums. Top Bed Talk. Um, I guess first I should introduce myself, though. I'm Desiree Chapel, host of Top Med Talk, and I'm joined here with my co-host today, Vicki Morton, who is a, a, one of our friends for Top Med Hello. Talk. Hello, Vicki. Hello, Desiree. And uh, our two very special guests that we have, uh, one is uh, Padma Gulur. She has been here with us before at EBPOM USA. Thanks for coming back, uh, Padma. She's the professor of anesthesia and the executive vice chair at Duke University. And we have Natasha Curran. She is a consultant in pain medicine and anesthesia at the University College Hospital and the medical director of the Health Innovation Network. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be pressed for time, but we're going to have some conversation and talk a little bit about pain control for the perioperative patient and how that works, especially with chronic pain patients. So, um, Natasha, I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you're doing right now with pain patients? Yeah, certainly. Hi, Desiree. I think one of the most important things is to identify the people who are at risk. So, at risk of um, potentially having lots of pain postoperatively or at risk of uh, other things like opioid addiction. So, we need to identify these people preoperatively, not just on the day of surgery. So if we can have mechanisms that we can do that, that's one of the things that I'm looking at at the moment. So in the system, before a patient comes to see a surgeon or after they've seen a surgeon, when the decision to, to have surgery is made, and also what things might be obvious things that we can say that if patients are on these type of medications like gabapentin, pregabalin, any of the opioids, that's probably a high chance that those patients are going to need a bit more input perioperatively and would like to be able to make a plan with those patients so that their outcomes, their length of stay, all of those things are better. Yeah. Padma, so this is, is kind of what you do, right, in, in the, pa- the past clinics. Can you expand, expand on that? Sure, absolutely. We do, we do uh, similarly look to optimize patients preoperatively and also for pain, we continue to follow them for up to 90 days after surgery because there's two identified gaps currently in the way we take care of these patients. One is the lack of optimization and how they present to surgery. There's a lot of evidence and data that supports that there's more that can be done before these patients have a stressful surgical experience, uh, per se. The other gap that's often overlooked is, while we do a great job with them for the intraoperative and postoperative period in the hospital, we get them all teed up, there is another cliff drop when they get discharged from the hospital because there is a transition of care element over there that is not usually you know, easy to bridge with the way things are currently. Because patients actually enter into what we are calling a subacute period. So, you know, they're done with the acute period. They're really not ready for a more outpatient or chronic care directly without getting further support in a subacute setting. And that's what this clinic, what we've started at Duke, is meant to help, which is from decision to surgery, as soon as you've decided that you're going to do surgery on this patient, you can send this patient to this clinic if they have any features of currently you know, experiencing uncontrolled pain, being in chronic pain, or uh, on high-dose opioids, but also patients who may be at risk for post-operative complications like Natasha just mentioned, which is persistent pain, uh, developing chronic pain eventually, or developing complications from the therapies used to treat pain, such as addiction, dependence, and other issues like that. You may well ask, well, how do you do that? How do you identify these patients? We're fortunate enough to have a bit of a head start with that in the sense that our records allow us to identify these patients currently, and we allow the surgeons as well to make a decision on sending these patients through. We run them through some screens, you know, simple screens that don't impact workflow immensely, and if they come out as positive, which is likely to have a poor outcome, then they are optimized in our clinic before surgery. Sometimes, in fact, we've had to postpone surgery in order to make that happen, you know, to get enough time to do it. Uh, but most times we are able to actually keep up with the surgical timeline. So I would like to ask both of you a question. You talk about the, the pre-op optimization and then following them for 90 days. And obviously, you know, when we when we talk about enhanced recovery, I don't think it's always our 100% goal to have an opioid-free surgery. We want patients to be comfortable, but 
we do sometimes have those patients that go through and, and they are completely opioid free or maybe they received a little fentanyl intraoperatively and postoperatively they've received nothing other than their multimodal analgesia yet they are going home with 30 of oxycodone how do you address that with your institutions I can speak to the, you know, our experience here at Duke. Um, you are so right. You know, we, we talk about opioid-free anesthesia, but we pr- truly just mean the intraoperative and likely the immediate, if we're lucky, postoperative period. For the most part, though, patients seem to go home on similar prescriptions. That's actually a factor of the workload and the workflow that has traditionally been in place. And you have all these templates and guide, guidelines which help in, you know, help in many ways with workflow, but can also, in this case, actually have unintended consequences where everyone gets the same prescription on their way out the door and the wrong message. So what we have done is actually surveyed the patients to create more personalized discharge plans for them on how much they need or if they need anything. And the templates have been changed so that the patient can only leave on that particular amount of medication. Natasha, I have a question for you. Does that happen in the UK, that, that, that you do this opioid sparing type of surgery and then they go home with a, a ton of narcotics? It definitely happens. The anesthetist might be quite on the ball for the very immediate post-operative period, but then what might happen on the ward afterwards and prior to discharge, there may be a disconnect there. And also that we don't there's definitely been a problem where there's not been um, I personally set the expectation with individual patients about how long they should be on an opioid for you know and saying that there may be some variation on that but so that they know that they should be coming off it and if you have a very junior doctor discharging them that might not be written on a discharge summary to the general practitioner or the family doctor who's looking after the patient after discharge um, and the other thing is that um, about 50% of the patients that come um, that are discharged on an opioid out of hospital, they, that's a new um, prescription. And the information that's then uh, that's then given to the family doctor about how long that should be continued is is very very poor. So I think that is a real gap and an opportunity for us to impact on population health. Really, it is a, it's a gap in the United States as well. Um, it's something that I think we've fallen down on. We are not engaging our primary mm-hmm. care partners in this whole process. We've tried to in where I live, and we've had small bits of engagement, but I think that we need to be better at helping educate them what we're doing in a perioperative phase, because it doesn't end when they walk out that door. Absolutely. It ends months Absolutely. and months down the line. No. I'd like to share another piece of good news, is that um, actually our national uh, perioperative quality improvement program, as, as one of its five stated priorities, that, uh, that has number four, is individualized pain management. And I think that you know, I've been in pain medicine or interested in it for many, year, many years now. <laughs> and it wasn't so seen as such a mainstream event. And now I think it is. And that I really welcome that. That it being seen as a, a true sort of theme of perioperative medicine means that many, many, many more doctors and the more junior ones in particular as well are, have, a, are, have an awareness about the importance of pain medicine and also how it can impact on outcomes and the potential pitfalls as well. So I think that whilst it may not be as kind of a, is it imp- impacting on curriculums as much, I think that there's a, there's a greater sense of its, its importance, which can only be good. Going beyond medicines as well, that's yeah. one of the big um, drives I've had in our hospital in the last two years has been p- uh, pain education, which is non-pharmacological as well. Right. Absolutely. You know, paying attention to the distress, which of course nurses traditionally have always done. They pay attention to the distress, not necessarily with uh, medicine that will resolve it, but pay, and you know, you know yourself, if someone pays attention to you, if you're having, a, if you're in pain, if you're in fearful, that has an impact. Even if you don't give them a medicine that will take away the pain, because that, that you know, simple that, acknowledgement, yeah. <laughs> yeah, makes everyone feel better. Yeah. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, make sure you've subscribed to Top Med Talk on your podcatcher or however it is that you're listening to us at the moment. And you're spoilt for choice. We're on pretty much every single podcast platform you could think of. Uh, So make sure you've subscribed. Make sure you've engaged with us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. And make sure you've signed up for our email updates on topmedtalk.com. If you get yourself there, you'll find a website that contains all of the podcasts that we've ever done and It gives you the chance to sign up for our email updates. That way we can always get in touch with you and tell you what we're up to. Oh, and while you're online, check out ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Have a look, ebpom.org forward slash meetings.